am gathering um, from the traditional territories of the uh, Cowichan people on Vancouver Island. Um, and I'm a part of the Trails BC team, as well as um, we have um, Sage on board as well. And we're going to do a brief introduction. Um, and prior to starting here, I'm just going to share my screen. So we are presenting today um, and having Karen Lay join us and presenting on valuing people with disabilities in the outdoors. This is a three-part webinar series regarding the increasing inclusion in active transportation series. So myself, Quiamat, um, Sage Kruger as the Indigenous Engagement Coordinator, and we also have Richard and uh, Cecile online as well. Um, prior to jumping into the presentation, we wanted to talk about the TV Trails Project, which is an inclusion project um, working with the Okanagan and working towards the uh, reconciliation um, with elders, land, and the Indigenous peoples. And we wanted to acknowledge that as a part of the work that we're doing and incorporating that into this webinar series as well. And uh, let's see, I'll stop sharing here. And I wanted to introduce Karen, who is a disability um, consultant who has been working in the field of increasing inclusion. Um, she has been supporting many policies and many initiatives, and she's going to speak um, today, and I'll have her give her an introduction, and she will um, lead the floor for about uh, half an hour, 40 minutes, and if anyone has any questions, we'll leave time at the end to ask any questions. If you can come in the Dropbox, and yeah, I'll pass the floor over to you, Karen. Thank you, Zika. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I'll probably be speaking about the half an hour, 40 minutes, um, and then open the floor up to questions. Um, my name is Karen, and I'm grateful for doing this work, what is central to the work we do is on, I'm living and residing on the lands of the Musqueam, Slaywood, Tooth, and Squamish Nations, and so grateful to be on these lands with them. Um, so before I introduce myself, I'm going and thank you to the people in the um, room that acknowledging the land it, where they um, residing in. So thank you very much. Um, the, I want to begin with an act activity. Um, I usually do this activity in small breakout rooms, but we're going to try something new. I've never done it this way, so bear with me. It's trial and error, but that's like that how I like to um, um, practice my life, is trial and error. So I want you to grab a piece of paper and individually um, write down your name, write down five things, uh, five good things about yourself and five bad things about yourself. So five good things and five, five not so good things about yourself or things that you can improve on. So I'll give you a few minutes um, and then, yeah, we can. Thank you. 
read it, uh, Greg. Okay. Yeah, the, they give an uh, opening your heart, especially to Flora and Leia. It's a very challenging thing to open your heart right at the beginning where no one knows you. It takes, like Gavin is saying, takes courage and that they glad that they weren't had. So I use this activity quite a lot to simulate the vulnerability of having a disability. Right from the get-go, when I do any outdoor activities, I have to be open about my disability. I have to open my heart and I have to be brave, vulnerable, to share what I what I need for support to be in the outdoors. Um, the that little activity um, that was um, that was demonstrated really demonstrated really opened the discussion tonight about valuing people with disabilities in the outdoors. So thank you to my participants, Flora, Leia, John, um, and everyone else that um, participated. Now I'm going to share my screen again. Can everyone see? The, yep, everything on screen. The, oh, why can't I move it? Oh. And hang on a little technical. So let me introduce myself. I'm um I love the outdoors and I see my friend Brianne on the line and see and I go way back and I do a lot of the kayak trips through Spirit of the West kayaking. Um and there's me kayaking. And I ride a adult tricycle. I love hiking with my walker and my poles. I love being in the outdoors. I live with cerebral palsy since birth. And it's been a journey of discovering who I am discovering my identities, what I bring, and learning a lot about how I position myself in the world we live in today. So like my, so we all have assumptions about disabilities and we get it through a culture, through uh, um, family, through social media, through other people, what we know. And there are generally so many assumptions of people with disabilities. And there's been typically, under the medical model, there is segregation. We, and way back when, there was exclusion, where we were institutionalized. And then there, was, there has been a slow movement toward segregation, where people with disabilities are within 
their own group. This is why we have a lot of adaptive recreation programs, um, like with adaptive kayaking, adaptive skiing, whatever. We always have mainstream and segregated programs because this is what we believe did the ability to be to be. So we we have a landscape of recreation for people with disabilities from exclusion, without segregation, um, and then slow integration. So meaning people that were segregated earlier were actually returned back to the mainstream. So they're integrated, but are they well included? And the circle on their right hand side is where all the colored dots are in one big circle. So right now we call this inclusion. But is it really? So when people with disabilities are mixed in with other people, is that inclusion? And when I and I went through this journey as a person with a lived experience of disabilities, and there's been times where I question whether that really inclusion. And to me, inclusion is the feeling of a sense of welcoming and a feeling of sense of belonging. What I have learned in my quest of inclusion is that we as men, much of society tend to categorize things and we categorize people. And the danger of within disability, we only categorize people according to their disability. But we know that human as human beings we are a very complex human being. Not only do I have a disability, I identify as a cis female. I identified as well educated. Um, I identify as middle class. I identify as middle age. All of these identities make up who I am today. So if you take another person with the exact same disability, exact same level of CP as me, but you place them with a upbringing of a single mother, no siblings, you'll have a very totally different story than me who comes from a two married heterosexual couple with a sibling. So, so all of our identities make up the complexity of the of who we bring as a human being. So I often describe as as people as layers of onions. I like onions. We all have layers of identity that we bring to any situation. And on top of our identities that we bring, 
Our mood changes from day to day, from minute to minute. I know I get very so tempered when I don't eat anything. So the that adds to the complexity of us being humans with all these identities. So to me, I believe that inclusion is about having choice. It's not one or the other, it's about having choice because we are a very complex human being and very messy being. That we, and the choice begins to turn to the person, to the individual. I might, the one day, I might go and do segregated programs because I like it. I feel I have more support. Whereas another day, I may go and do a mainstream kayaking program. It depends how I am positioned that day that year, that month, the, the choice becomes if we value the individual with a disability, the inclusion is about choice. Where do we feel the most welcomed and belonged? And that can mean so many different things to so many different people because we all bring our own identities. So inclusion is not a program. Inclusion is a mindset. It is the way how we treat each other, the way how they treat us. Inclusion is about the opportunity uh, inclusion is all is the opportunity to learn together and from one another. So inclusion is all about having a choice. So going back to the exercise that we did, and I know Floyd, Flora, and um, Leah touched on vulnerability a bit, and that's exactly right. Vulnerability, and I love Dr. Brene Brown. This one, the has it read in a book specifically about disability, but a lot of the things that they talked about is about being vulnerable. And when she defines vulnerability, she goes, it's the birth place of love, belonging, joy, create empathy and creativity. It is the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. If we want greater clarity in our purpose or deeper and more meaningful spiritual lives, vulnerability is the path. If I want to participate in a mainstream sport, I've got to be vulnerable enough to share what kind of support I need and what kind of adaptive equipment. I need to be vulnerable and be open about it. This is who I am. And that takes a lot of vulnerability 
but that other date vulnerability from the organizers, from this board organizers, is that, okay, I'm willing to give you a shot. I may screw up, I may make mistakes, but let's work together. So on both sides of the equation, it takes vulnerability. And that to me is inclusion. Where I get to choose, where I want to position myself. I don't have to be self-defined as, oh, you go and do adaptive programs because you have a disability. But that's not my choice. Everyone here on this call and beyond has a choice of how they want to live their life. And that goes the same way for people with disabilities as well. So I know I'm going to, if my friend, Brianne on the line. I'm going to give a big shout out to Brianne um, from Spirit of the West. So I've been working with many um, kayaking outfitters, and unfortunately, many kayakers are outdoor outfitters. As soon as they say that you have a disability, they don't want to deal with you because A, they may not have the experience or may not have the knowledge or they may not have the equipment. And they are a bit intimidated. I I love outdoor kayaking on and I and I met Brian um from Spirit of the West kayaking and they were lovely. They were amazing to deal with because right at the beginning it was all open conversation. I was vulnerable and they were vulnerable right from the get-go. And I needed to accept in myself their own life. They've got a responsibility to keep people safe, to meet the liability, to meet the risk liability. Although maybe I can do things more by myself, I need to let go of my shield a bit and say, if I want to do this, we've got to work together. I've got to, um, I've, we've just got to work together. Though so I've been going on a number of the trips together and um, quite recently, like about three years ago, we started getting a support person for me. Good. Even though I may be able to go kayaking with, you know, by myself, it needs a level of understanding from both ends. I don't know if Brianne wants to defend or say anything. Brianne, are you on the line? I don't know. We'll get going. Um, so let's, let's see. So my main message is that inclusion is, it takes to do tango. It really does. It takes me to be willing to accept my vulnerability, accept my identity, 
and it makes the outdoor outfitted um, vulnerability, openness, um, accepting, tolerant, and learn different ways to offer the programs, creative a bit. But this may not be as easy as it seems. It takes a lot of work to achieve what I think inclusion should be. Inclusion is about choice, but there's some challenges to do inclusion this way. It may be because people with disabilities have a long history of being segregated. And some people with disabilities have been conditioned, have been conditioned by the family, by the groups that they associate with, by their, um, by their friends, to have a submissive power. So if they were given the opportunity to make a choice, they would say, they will wait to everyone access and then follow through. Some of them tend to be overprotected by their parents, caregivers, foster parents. Some of them don't have the tools and knowledge to participate, the lack of self-advocacy. Some of them lack the financial resources. And some people with disabilities really think negatively because of the world we live in about their position, about how they are positioned in their own disability. And I'm just going to turn on my light. Hang on. So, the, some of them are positioned quite negatively viewing their own disability. From the other side of the relationship, others, community members and service providers, they, we deal with systematic ableism. The ableism is the thought that people with disabilities are of lower status, a lower class than people without disabilities. So like inspiring or like, um, like talking over you, making choices for yourself. The, the issue of help is a very interesting concept because we, we in society tend to view help because you're not able to do things by yourself. And we pride we as in society pride ourselves to be independent, to be successful. So, so, and we look at some people with disabilities that may need more help than others as less than. So, and, but I ask you this, I ask every one of you, who has called up the friend this week for advice? We all need help. We all do. It's that 
um, if that in in do in do help um kind of scenario, we all need help from each other. And how is the power being distributed? Is it between able-bodied versus people with disabilities? And you look at you look at disabled organizations. Who's running the organizations? Able-bodied people. So um so right there it perpetuates this stereotype that people with disabilities are always needing help from people without disabilities. So where is the distribution of power? Another challenge that service providers may face is the inaccessibility, the adaptive, the lack of adaptive equipment and the lack of training. It takes um it takes courage, it takes, I mean, most of the pills are inaccessible, but it takes courage from both ends to say, okay, what can we do to make this work? It takes creativity, it takes being open, it takes curiosity. And some organizations may lack a sense of curiosity and the openness of wanting to learn. And then of course, um, education. The hope of assumptions about people with disabilities and stereotypes. So for inclusion to work, we need to create this base. We need the to create this base to allow relationships to happen. We need to recognize our own biases and awareness. And we need to bring a whole self to the congregation, a whole level of identities a whole self to the conversation. We've got to say, hey, you know what? I'm not familiar with people with disabilities, but can you help me learn? We need to bring ourselves to the conversation. We need to be curious. We need to ask questions, seek clarity, and if we don't know, ask for help, be vulnerable, be curious. And that goes for all the different parties when we're tangoing, when we're learning this new way of dancing towards inclusion. Again, this to wrap up, inclusion is not a program. It is a mindset. It takes to do tango. It takes understanding from both ends, acceptance, tolerance. And again, we need to bring ourselves to the whole selves, to the conversations. We need to have more brave conversations because that's where we start. Because at the end of the day, we all as human beings, we all crave the, to be valued, to have connections, and to have a sense of belonging. 
no matter what your level of identity is, we all crave to be valued, to be listened, to be, have connections, and to have belonging. So I'm going to end off this with a poem that I was, um, that I kind of came across. If you want, you can close your eyes or you can just listen. When you go into the woods and you look at trees, you see all these different trees. And some of them are bent, some of them are straight, and some of them are evergreens, and some of them are whatever. And, and you look at the tree and you allow it. You see why it is the way it is. You sort of don't understand. You, sorry, you sort of understand that it did not get enough light and so it turned that way. And you don't get all emotional about it. You just allow it. You appreciate the tree. The minute you get near humans, you lose all that. And you are constantly saying, you do this, or I do this that judging mind comes in. And so I want to invite all of you to turn people into trees and this really appreciating who that this the way they are. And so we need to remove our own biases, remove or recognize what identities that we bring to the table and recognize that those are just uh, my identities and be open-minded and be curious. And that's how the conversation of inclusion begins. It is the beginning. So I ask you to practice turning people into trees. Okay. So I'll stop sharing and open it up for questions. Did anyone have questions? Um, yeah, we kindly ask individuals um, to place your questions in the chat box. Um, um, however, I do see a question in the Q&A. So we have Pauline asking, what would be the key in making the outdoors accessible to all, to sum up? Building a relationship with everyone, and that takes work. Uh, we do see an appreciation um, saying that the poem was beautiful. Um, and then we also see another comment that we have biases and moving forward um, and then trying to remember how to acknowledge people with disabilities are more than just their diagnosis or disability. Absolutely. Absolutely. We tend to only, oh, I see a question. We don't 
tend to only view people with disabilities as their own disabilities. So, yeah. Um, Damon has uh, working out the recreation groups, per, working out the recreation groups to promote inclusion in the outdoors. I would say, you know, I struggle with the term welcome on ability. I've seen that um, recruiting strategy, oh, we welcome all abilities. And yes, you might be right, but I also question whether you have the right, um, do you have enough staff resources? Do you have the, a sense of openness, a sense of curiosity? Um, so I would, do you promote inclusion? I would almost say, like, if you have the sense of openness, curiosity, um, and a level of understanding. It's not rocket science. Um, and I go back to the book of what you all learned in kindergarten by Robert Pogram. And then it's like, if a person comes up to me and says, I need this, to, to be open and accepting and willing to take on and just build that relationship. Uh. Do you facilitate the questions? Yeah, definitely. So to the next question, how do you determine trails that are accessible for you? It all depends on my mood that day, whether I want a hard trail or a easy trail or whether my body is up for it that day. So it all depends on what I feel like, just like anyone else. And I tend to be a easygoing person. So I can make do with quite a few trails, um, find creative ways to go about things. but. Yeah, so it all depends on my mood of the day. Okay, uh, let's see. Again, to remind people if we can put questions in the chat. I'm trying to go through. Well, we'll see. Um, how does one educate or train to become an inclusion and accessibility consultant? they're interested in this area as a potential future career? I would say, um, yeah, so, you know, if I don't have a real good answer for you because as you can sense for my presentation, I do things by trial and error. Um, is this to get out, I would think this to get out there, be brave and show up in this space and, you know, and this credit your ability and credit what you will bring to the conversation. And 
Give everyone got gifts, everyone got felt. So this is um the this, this learning and being curious and meeting people and bringing your whole self to the table. Excellent. Um let's see here. So I just want to be mindful of everyone's time. So just in case if anyone has to jump off, what's the best way to contact you if they have further questions or comments? The, you can um, either, um, I can type my email. The, the is Karen.play. Hello. That you can email me there. Oh, you can find me on my website. And um, that is inclusion accessibility.com. We do have an extended uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I believe, here. So we can. Uh, finish answering whatever questions uh, Karen's able to, just uh, as a reminder. Okay, perfect. We'll continue going through. Um, another question in the Q&A. Uh, let's see. Where do you see the financial support structures and education for support coming from? What what do you mean by that? Can you clarify? Like, uh, okay. some of them come from the government, but it depends on season. Okay, we'll let Jason clarify. Are you able to speak, Jason? It looks like we can hear. I mean, this is very different form of funding from anything from um, government funding, the individual funding. The, I'm not sure how the education since them works. I mean, and this is why probably um, diagnosis is so important because your diagnosis is dependent on your um, amount of funding. But unfortunately, people are so set on the concept of diagnosis and we never leave that conversation alone. And so that this is why we're in, so ingrained in this medical model of disability. Um, I do see a question here. How, as, how do support workers, how can support workers support clients in getting into the outdoors in areas of BC that are more remote and do not have current, or do not currently have many services for people and children with disabilities? Um, I would say the level of being in outdoors, it can vary from, going outside on a lunch break, walking around the block, do hiking about, hiking up Mount Everest. So it's really varied. So what do you term as outdoor experience? I guess that's a first, um, first misnomer 
about we need the like really think of what we did doing as outdoor experiences. And that can look so different from one person to another person. And, and also, I would also build a relationship with your person that you're supporting. Are they able to make a choice about where they want to go? Are they able to contribute of the, how they're able to get outdoors? So they should be part of the discussion in making the outdoors accessible. And quite often, I see a lot of support workers making the choice for them. So it's having that conversation first and how we shift our thinking in what we determine the outdoors to be. And I think we're nearing our one of our final questions. Um, what do you recommend someone with a negative view of their disability? What can they do to break through that with the internal mental barrier? Yeah, um, I think everyone goes through their own journey. Um, and a journey can last up to a few minutes or many, many years. And I've I've always, you know, even in my teenage years, I've had a very negative view. Um, but I think it's searching within yourself, writing a journal is always good. You know, always saying, you know, I, I learned this from Oprah. I was watching Oprah one day and she was saying, write a gratitude journal where you say five good things about yourself and five things that you're thankful for. And I wrote this journal as I was going through my own identity. And how do I position myself? And I was quite bullied and quite um, um, sad about myself and my situation. And the, I, would, I went through the journey of knowing how to position myself and knowing how to accept myself. And, and through that, I realized that once I accepted myself, my relationships with others strengthened in a positive way. That I, and the, it, until you fully accept yourself, you cannot, it's, you, your life is different, so, yeah. Excellent. Um, just wonderful words and wonderful comments. Um, praising for the, the insights, the knowledge, the wisdom, and your overall philosophy and approach. I think you enlightened and enriched us all with your experiences and of course your knowledge as well. I uh, wanted to, again, reiterate if you have further questions, uh, Karen has put her email in the chat and let's see to conclude the webinar, uh, we would like to encourage everyone to see your social media, sign up for a newsletter, check out the website, uh, a reminder that this is a three-part series. So we have a, another webinar being hosted on March 8th. 
And again, just we raise our hands up in gratitude, Karen, for sharing your time and your wisdom and answering all of our questions. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you to everyone that attended. I encourage everyone to check out the links in the chat. Um, we have our social media links. We have the webinar for the next series. And yeah, tons of lovely comments here. And thank you guys so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. <laughs>